Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marika Vander Steenhoven, and I'm the Special Collections Education and Outreach Engagement Librarian at the Bowdoin College Library. I recently changed my title, so forgive me for the flub. Um, it's so wonderful to see all of you here in the audience today. I am joined in the reading room um, behind the scenes uh, by Kat Stefko, the Special Collections um, and Archives director. And I want, again, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, we're all gathered remote still, but we've had such a busy semester here in special collections and archives. Our reading room has been filled with student researchers looking into the history of the college, the history of books, and so many other topics. We've hosted over 25 classes here in the archives that have come in multiple times. Um, and it's just been a very exciting semester to kind of get things uh, a little bit back to normal. So, we are on Zoom today, um, which is exciting because we get to welcome a guest who is joining us from across the country. Um, uh, a few announcements before I introduce our guest speaker, who is um, no stranger to us here in Special Collections and Archives. We will be doing one final, um, this is the last uh, page turning of the Bowdoin semester, the spring semester, but we will be doing a, a a page turning in June, um, the first Friday of the month at 1230. Um, and uh, that will coincide with uh, Bowdoin's reunion. So we're excited to have those two events come together. So today uh, we are joined by our very uh, special guest, Peter Logan, who is Bowdoin class of 1975. Uh, Peter is a lifelong birder and widely recognized as one of America's preeminent Audubon scholars. Using the skills he developed as a Georgetown trained lawyer with decades of experience litigating California civil cases, he has unearthed dozens of new discoveries about Audubon's life and work over the past 15 years, many of which were revealed in his essential 2016 biography entitled Audubon, America's Greatest Naturalist and His Voyage of Discovery to Labrador. Since then, his continuing research has resulted in two groundbreaking papers that were published last year in the Archives of Natural History. A third has just been accepted by the Archives and will appear next spring. We are delighted to have him back to share some of his recent discoveries and discuss how they have shaped, reshaped what previous scholars have long believed. Um, I believe that this is Peter's third time joining us and we're just so thrilled um, that, uh, that he is um, with us and also um, uh, just, you know, it's incredible to have our, what I consider our very own Audubon scholar here to help us interpret our copy. So for those of you who have joined us before, you know the routine, Kat and I are going to flip the bird um, and then turn things over to Peter. So I'm gonna just switch my camera and you will see um, Kat and my hands um, turning the page. One thing you should note is that we are not wearing white gloves and that <clears throat> um, we are turning the page with clean hands and that actually increases the, um, uh, the sensitivity. So we're able to actually feel the pages and not tear them, um, which is less damaging than wearing the gloves, which reduces your sense of tactility. So here we go. We're going to say goodbye to these beautiful warblers. Let's see. Is the camera's not even big enough right now to see the full thing? Let's zoom out just a little bit. <clears throat> Okay. So Peter, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Well, it is a delight. I wish I was back there looking at this live. <laughs> we wish you were here too. <laughs> so let's see here. What do I do next? You're gonna, <laughs> we're going to talk Peter through uh, sharing his screen, which is the green button down at the bottom. Okay, there we go. All right. And here we go. And I think. There we are. There we are. Excellent. Beautiful. All right. I'm just going to try to move this over here. All right. So I am now ready. I'm on the clock. <laughs> um, 
in 1985, on the bicentennial of Audubon's birth, Audubon magazine ran a wonderful biographical sketch of a naturalist written by a nature writer, Michael Harwood. He indicated in that that despite all that had been written about Audubon over the years, there were still discoveries to be made. And I questioned that at the time, but in my own research, I've found that to be true. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about three new discoveries I've recently made. Um, I think they're really cool. I, I hope you will as well. But before we go down the rabbit hole, I'd like to talk about the iconic ivory-billed woodpecker. Audubon called it the great chieftain of the woodpecker tribe, and, and no wonder. With its wingspan of 30 inches, it is the largest woodpecker north of Mexico. Uh, its smaller cousin, the pileated, uh, can sometimes be confused with the ivory bill, but it has a darker sil silver bill, uh, it has a white throat, and its back is completely black. It doesn't have those dorsal stripes or the prominent white wing panels that you see in the ivory bill. Uh, historically, it could be found from East Texas all the way to the Carolinas, uh, throughout Florida, and down into Cuba. Uh, it made its home in mature bottomland hardwood forests in the southeast. Uh, unfortunately, those areas began to be heavily logged beginning in the 1880s and through the early part of the 20th century. That, along with uh, hunting the birds, led to its population decline. The last confirmed sighting of an ivory bill in the wild was in 1944 in what was called the Singer Tract in Northeast Louisiana. Uh, efforts were made to save that land, but unfortunately it was logged uh, throughout the, the 1940s. And by mid-century, the ivory bill was presumed to be, to be extinct. However, uh, up until 1999, there were uh, occasional but unconfirmed sightings of the bird. And then in April of 2005, there was a bombshell announcement by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which announced that the bird had been seen in a wildlife refuge in uh, Eastern Arkansas and had been observed by knowledgeable individuals a total of seven times. There was minimal acoustic evidence of its existence, but one of the observers was able to get a four second blurry video that the lab confirmed was indeed an ivory bill. However, not everyone agreed with that. Um, critics analyzed the video and claimed that in fact, this was a pileated woodpecker. They pointed out that the sightings did not supply independent verifiable evidence of its existence. And the acoustic evidence, even the lab had conceded, was not definitive. Nevertheless, over the next five years, from 2006 to, to 2010, there were extensive search efforts conducted throughout the bird's range, over eight states, 523,000 acres. And even after that, additional surveys were conducted up until 2019 that uh, searched any area where there were claims that the bird had been seen or heard. In 2019, however, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which was overseeing the recovery effort, came out with a five-year status report. And uh, its findings were not optimistic. They pointed out that no individuals were reliably located despite all the efforts that had been made to find it, that there was no conclusive evidence that confirmed the species existence. And they recommended that it be delisted de as being extinct. <clears throat> so <clears throat> last September, the service proposed um, an, a, a rule that would delist, formally delist the species. I gave the, the public 60 days to comment in November. They extended that for another 30 days. And then in January of this year, they held a public hearing. Numerous uh, experts, ornithologists stepped forward and indicated that the proposal was premature, that the service had not taken into consideration all the evidence pointing out that in fact, the bird still exists. And then last month, uh, the National Aviary in Pittsburgh and Project Principalis posted on the web a preprint of a paper that is undergoing peer review. They concluded that there were multiple lines of evidence demonstrating that the bird is still flying in those southern swamps. From 2011 to 2021, they conducted their own research and field surveys in bottomland forests where the bird 
would be expected to, to survive if it survived at all. They indicated in the paper that reliable observers reported more than a dozen high quality observations of ivory billed woodpeckers. And this is the kicker. They set up trail cameras throughout where they had either heard or possibly seen the birds. And they took photographs in 2019 and 2021. And each of those showed a bird, and I'm quoting, with a clear white saddle on the lower part of the folded wings. That can only be an ivory billed woodpecker. So is it extinct? Not at all. And we certainly hope that the service is going to uh, back off its efforts to try to delist it from the Endangered Species Act. And now that brings us to John James Audubon. Um, first, I want to talk, to, uh, talk about the perspectives for the birds of America. Going back to 1827, when Audubon obtained his, his first set or fascicle of the first five prints of the birds of America, he has this enormous publication that's going to be ridiculously expensive. And he has to sell it uh, because he's anticipating that there are going to be 400 prints ultimately when he's finally finished. How is he going to sell that? Well, by making sales calls on wealthy individuals throughout England. And as part of that, he needed a prospectus, a written piece of paper that he could hand out, uh, which would describe the nature, scope, and cost of the publication. The first one was published in Edinburgh on March 17, 1827, shortly before he left for London. Uh, and since that date, uh, there were numerous prospectuses that he issued as new information or new selling points came out that he thought were important to, to, uh, to have his potential subscribers know about. What part of this story requires you to know something about a gentleman named Pat Freeze. Uh, he was a Cornell grad, class of 1911, and spent his career working in the banking industry, retiring in 1955. Uh, over the next 15 years, he uh, basically set about tracing as many copies of the Birds of America that still existed as he could. And in the process, he discovered a number of the editions of the prospectus. In 1973, he published his research in, in a landmark book called The Double Elephant Folio. He identified 16 copies of six different editions, which he designated as edition A, the first one published in 1827, all through edition F in 1835. In addition, he identified an ad that had run in a, a British publication in 1837 that warned anyone who had not yet subscribed to do so quickly because after the work was completed, there would be no further copies that would be available for sale. Uh, during uh, some of the, the research that I did with uh, a colleague of mine, Marty Sedor, uh, we began to question some of uh, Freeze's findings. And basically what we determined was that he had actually misclassified three of his 16 copies of the prospectus uh, we found three new editions, including what was actually the first printing of the, of the uh, prospectus, which is now at Yale. Uh, we identified 88 additional copies of the prospectus that he did not know anything about. And we also traced copies of the final ads, which appeared in multiple British publications, as well as in newspapers throughout the United States. And we also developed a new classification system which uses the year of publication along with letter designations and references using numbers if there are variants within that specific year. But basically, uh, these are the numbers and, and um, those were our designations, our new classifications of the various advertisements that were published. Um, the ones that are highlighted in gold are the ones that were new that, that Freeze had not been aware of. We also identified several putative editions. These are copies of, of the prospectus that we know from things that are in the historic record that existed, that it, they were published, but no one has yet been able to find them. Uh, one in 1827, after Audubon moved the publication to London with the, the Havels, um, had the first publication of the names of subscribers. And that appeared somewhere between June and August of 1827. Uh, there was also one that followed that probably in September of that year, 
after King George IV became a subscriber and a patron. And then there was one after George's death in 1830, uh, George's name was substituted with the name of the wife of, of George's heir, uh, Queen Adelaide. We also think that there may have been one when Audubon returned to America in 1836 and uh, intended to explore the Gulf Coast for additional birds, but he was also making sales calls in America. And as a consequence, we have evidence from a document at Yale that he was at least considering publishing an American edition. But again, that has not been located. So the next discovery uh, deals with composite prints. And if you didn't have a chance to hear the March presentation by Jeff Holt and, and Bert Fillmire, uh, you're in for a treat. Go back and look at it. Uh, I highly recommend their book. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, not expensive. It's chock full of colored photographs and they really do a masterful work in um, discussing this. For those of you who didn't get a chance to see that presentation, let me recap. In 1838, following the completion of the Birds of America, Audubon asked Robert Havel Jr. to make 13 additional prints. What he wanted Havel to do was to take uh, individuals on uh, the same species that appeared on uh, a secondary print and add it to the primary print where members of that species had originally appeared. Six copies of each of these composite prints were made, although we know of a seventh, uh, which would give you 79 total prints that were made. The, the three best prints out of those 79 went to Audubon and two of his friends, Dr. Benjamin Phillips in London and Audubon's close friend, Edward Harris, uh, in America, a close friend and, and benefactor. Uh, there are additional six sets that have some number of composite prints. Um, and uh, one of those additional ones was broken up. That was the New York Society Library set. Uh, Bowdoin, of course, has four. Uh, but basically, if you add all of those up, you come up with a total of 64 prints, which means that there are 15 additional prints out there uh, that have not been located. So I'd like to talk briefly about the New York Society Library set because that's where the discovery is. This was examined uh, prior to 1973 by Fries when he was, as I said, tracing all of these existing copies. Uh, he identified three, three composite prints in that set, the Maryland yellowthroat, which is now called the common yellowthroat, the hooded warbler and the evening grosbeak and spotted grosbeak, the latter being black-headed grosbeak, it's a Western species. However, in, in 1973, uh, the entire set was stolen by what the New York Times called the errant son of a member. Uh, however, uh, 351 of the 435 prints were recovered uh, thereafter. And in 1980, the library put up uh, 345 of the stolen prints uh, at auction at Sotheby's. They kept five for their collection, or I guess it would be six if they kept for their collection, none of which are composite prints. I located by going through the catalog four additional composite prints that were referenced in the two catalogs for that auction. And these are the ones that I found, the Canada Jay, the Wilson's Plover, the Sanderling, and then Nuttall Starling, which is the tricolored blackbird today, the yellow-headed trupial, which is the yellow-headed blackbird, and then the Bullock's Oriole. Now, this is what is kind of mysterious about this and uh, open for, for subsequent research. None of the composite prints that Fry's counted were in the auction. The yellow throat and the hooded warbler were not recovered among those that were. And plates 373, the evening gross beak and the spotted gross beak, it was sold in the auction, but it was not the composite print. Uh, all I can guess is that uh, the thief wound up selling those that weren't recovered and someone may have exchanged a non-composite print for the composite print, which is obviously much more rare and valuable. The big question is, how did uh, Pat Fries, who was a, a dogged researcher and um, Notwithstanding some of the mistakes we found with respect to the prospectuses, uh, you know, somebody to, to obviously admire, how did he miss the four that were in the auction? I don't have an answer for that. 
I'm going to toss this over to, to Bert and Jeff, and maybe they can get an answer at some point. Finally, I want to talk about Audubon's lost miniature. And we have to start out giving you some of the historical background. In 1831, Audubon and Lucy sat for miniature portraits by Frederick Cruikshank in London. Uh, three years later, after they had come back from America uh, after a three-year visit, Cruikshank reworked Audubon's painting so that it would depict him as the American woodsman, which is a persona that he created for himself and, and liked to use uh, because it basically helped sell copies of the Birds of America. 1835, Robert Hamill Jr. had a mezzotint engraving by Charles Turner, one of the best engravers in England, published uh, and, and put up for sale in his uh, store or shop in London. And in 1874, Audubon's miniature and other family heirlooms were lost in a fire in Shelbyville, Kentucky, where Lucy had recently died. This is a copy of the, the Turner mezzotint. And as a result of the fire and the destruction of those heirlooms, it was the only surviving representation of the Cruikshank miniature. Uh, it, was a, it, it basically used all the time to represent Audubon's visage, uh, appeared in numerous publications, and it was copied multiple times by, by other engravers. This is a copy of uh, a, a bus portrait that was done by John Sartain. Um, this is another one that was done by Jacob Gross. And this was done by an unidentified engraver. Uh, a copy of this is at the Library of Congress. The other part of the story that you need to know something about are the, the carts de visites, the CDVs. These were uh, introduced to America around 1859 uh, to 1860. Uh, basically, an albumin photograph was pasted on a card measuring two and a half by four inches, which was approximately the size of a calling card. They were cheaper to produce than other photographic formats at the time. It became wildly popular in what's been called cardomania, where people put cards together almost like young kids today put them in sleeves and, and say baseball cards or their sports cards. Uh, photographers throughout America sold CDVs as part of their business and included uh, images of famous Americans and celebrities for collectors to, uh, to collect, but also to attract sitting customers. Charles Fredericks was one of the best photographers in New York City at the time. He was a founder of Charles D. Fredrickson Company uh, in 1855, and he opened up uh, a large studio on Broadway called the Temple of Art. And this is a carte de visite of Audubon that Fredericks issued sometime in presumably the early 1860s. Uh, I discovered it in a private collection last year, and I believe that it is the only known photograph of Audubon's lost miniature. Now, why do I believe that? What's the basis for my opinion? Well, we know that the miniature was in Lucy's possession until the time she died in 1874. Uh, the Audubon family's estate was located in Upper Manhattan, about nine miles away from the Frederick studio, uh, and obviously very easily accessible. Uh, Lucy was facing some significant financial problems in the early 1860s, and if she was able to earn anything in the way of a license fee, uh, it would have obviously helped her situation. Uh, keeping her husband, her late husband, in the public eye was always something she was interested in doing. This obviously was one of the things that would do it. But most importantly, we know that Fredericks also issued a CDV of Lucy's miniature, which was also likely destroyed in the Shelby Hill fire. This is a photo that was taken at some point before 1897 of Lucy's miniature. It was identified as such by her granddaughter who obviously would have known that, um, that it came from the miniature. Uh, it was underdeveloped, but this was the only photograph we had of Lucy for virtually forever. Uh, it's published in, in almost every single book that you will see about Audubon. 
Um, and that's what we had. And then this is the copy of Lucy's CDV uh, from Fredrickson Company that I discovered. If we take a close look at both photos side by side, I've darkened the one from the CDV. You can see it's, it's the identical photograph. Uh, obviously, as uh, an outstanding photographer, Fredericks was able to, to properly uh, prepare it for publication, develop it. And a lot of the finery in Lucy's clothes is evident here, which you can't see on the photograph that we used from um, the publication by Audubon's granddaughter. So let's compare the Audubon CDV with the Turner engraving. Um, you can see Turner did a really excellent job of capturing the likeness and the way the clothing falls. I mean, he was a master engraver, no doubt. But I want to focus on Audubon's face. This is the CDV on the left, and this is Turner's engraving on the right. And I think what you'll see here is that Turner accentuated the size of Audubon's eyes, especially the size of his irises. The ones in the CDV are, are smaller. Why did he do that? I can only speculate. Audubon had these magnificent eyes that contemporaries spoke about in their diaries and their journals and their letters. And perhaps this was Turner's way to make that happen in an engraving that that otherwise would not really give you an idea of how Audubon looked when you met him. Now, why wasn't this discovery made before now? Well, the, the CDVs are extremely rare. Uh, I've gone and, and looked at the holdings of the major Audubon collections in the country and in England, uh, as well as collections in smaller libraries and institutional collections, and they're not there. They may have CDVs, but they don't have copies of, of this CDV. Um, there is a set uh, at the New Brunswick Museum. So as far as I've been able to trace them, there are only two that exist. I'm sure there are more and perhaps uh, we'll learn more about that as time goes on. The curators of the museum recognized that indeed the CDVs were after uh, Crookshank, but um, they weren't apparently aware that the, the original miniatures had been lost. Um, there are two different publications uh, that feature uh, one or both. Uh, there's a wonderful biography by Deborah Lindsay that came out in 2018 about uh, John Bachman's second wife, uh, Maria Martin, which included a, a picture of the CDV at the at this New Brunswick Museum. Uh, and then there's a, a, if you go online, there's a blog post uh, by a member of, of, I believe, the museum that has both of them that you can see, but again, it wasn't mentioned that these in fact are the only, uh, or at least in Audubon's case, the only existing image that we have of that, of that lost miniature. So that's our, our journey down the rabbit hole for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, I certainly did. I'd be happy to ask you, ask, or have you ask any questions and see if I can field them properly without stumbling over what I'm saying. Peter, thank you so much. I was um, wearing my mask while watching this. Otherwise, my jaw would have been on the floor. You have been so busy. It's amazing. Um, perhaps, do you mind um, stopping to share your screen so we can? Oh, yes. Sharing yeah. my screen, yes. And while I do that, I will pull up. We have two questions in the chat so far. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, so the first question is from Janet um, with regards to the composite prints, and she is curious about where these composite prints could be. Um, she's curious if maybe you think they could be in someone's attic. There's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the great thing about, about doing research is that there are things that pop up all the time. Frequently, they, they wind up showing up in somebody's auction, and, you know, if you just take a look at what Christie's and Sotheby's and other auction houses offer, it's frequently something that nobody has seen in decades. Uh, so yes, I do believe that they could, could be hiding there. They could also be hiding in, in somebody's um, collection who is even more open about you know, what, what they have and mm -hmm. we just don't know about it because they don't publish it. Right, 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 right. 
Thank you. Um, our next question is from Sue, who's wondering um, about, and I think this refers to the, the um, new outlining of the additions. Um, she's curious about which edition Bowdoin holds. Well, the additions- Or wait, of, instance, perhaps. <clears throat> uh, you mean the, the additions of the composites? Yes. Uh, you know, I have a list of that. I've got a paper that I have been needing to, to get published about Audubon's set at Bowdoin, mm -hmm. which has all of that information. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, she can send you her contact information. And as soon as this gets published, she can get a copy. Perfect. So we do know, we do know which four Bowdoin has. It's just, I can't rattle it off on the top of my head. And I believe it's on our um, uh, Audubon website. I, sh I they, oh. they are also floating around in my head somewhere, um, but not, <laughs> not retrievable at this moment. Um, which leads me to a, a question. I have, I have one more from the chat, but I have one I'm going to sneak in here, which is I'm curious about um, if you're working on any Audubon projects right now. I mean, that. Well, other than that, that, that paper that I've been promising yeah. you for the last several years about <laughs> the origins of a Bowdoin set. Um, yeah, I am working on something that, that ties into the, um, to the work that I did that led up to the biography. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to not going to really go into more detail because okay. until I find a publisher, it's just something sitting on my computer. But mm -hmm. yes, I'm working on Audubon all the time. Fabulous. Um, I just, you just demonstrate like the um, passion and the addictiveness of research and your presentation just, uh, just situates just a fabulous example of situating research into a scholarly conversation and engaging text with questions. It's just, is fabulous. So thank you for your presentation. We have one more question, and this is from Lisa, um, who says, thank you for the heartening info about the ivory-billed woodpecker. You mentioned that during some of the debate around the status of the ivory-billed woodpecker, that there was insufficient or no acoustic evidence. Does the ivory-billed have a different sound or set? of calls than the pileated woodpecker, or are they quite similar? Uh, they're different. And the problem is that uh, the acoustic evidence that exists, uh, you know, they've, it's not that they haven't captured it, but they can't specifically say with certainty that it's an ivory build that's making it. I mean, jays, for instance, mimic other birds. Uh, and so, um, they're just not willing to hang their hat on that. What, what the scientific community wants to have is some definitive proof. They want a carcass of a deceased ivory bill. They want feathers. They want mm. a photograph that could be published on the, the front cover of National Geographic. Uh, and the problem is these birds, because they were so heavily hunted, the ones that survived, and, and I will say today, I, there's no question in my mind that they still survive. Um, they are very wary of human beings. They, they live in areas that are inaccessible uh, in these swamplands that birders don't go. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood that we're gonna get a National Geographic type photo is very, very small. Mm -hmm. But I really encourage everyone to take a look at this preprint. It's on the web mm -hmm. and um, you can see the, the photos for yourself. They're at a distance, but you see that diagnostic wing panel, that white wing panel, mm. the bottom of their wings on these birds that were photographed by the trail camera. So um, yeah, I mean, it's there. Yeah, oh, fabulous. Um, I wish we could just talk all day, but uh, <laughs> I wanna be cognizant of time. Peter, thank you so much for all of the, the research and scholarship that you're doing. It's just, it's enriching our experience here at the Page Turning and also just our knowledge about Audubon and this incredible book. So thank you so much for joining us once again. And um, thanks to all of you in the audience. There are all sorts of praise popping up into the chat. So thank you again to all of you and thank you, Peter. And we will see you here um, or rather on Zoom. Um, on June 3rd. Thanks and be well. Bye.